Boston Public Radio, live from our GVH studio at the Boston Public Library. Tom Brady isn't the only famous guy in Massachusetts fighting time. So is Governor Deval Patrick. His late entry into the 2020 race is pollsters saying he has no clear path to the nomination. But even though his road to the White House sounds like an obstacle course, he's remaining optimistic about his shot at the White House. He joins us to talk about why he thinks he has a fighting chance. At noon, Emily Rooney is here with a famous list of fixations and fulminations. And President Trump started the new year by agitating two of our most dangerous adversaries, North Korea and Iran. Now that he's killed Iran's top military leader, did he just compromise our national security and make it a priority for the 2020 race? Juliet Kayyem joins us for this and more on Boston Public Radio, 89.7 WGBH, broadcasting from the Boston Public Library. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Dale Willman. President Trump says that Iranian General Qasem Soleimani had been plotting to kill many more Americans before U.S. forces killed him in an airstrike in Baghdad this morning, Iraq time. NPR's Franco Ordonez reports on the president's explanation for the strike. In his first comments justifying the strike, President Trump said the Iranian general has killed or badly wounded thousands of Americans over an extended period of time. And he said he was planning more deaths, but, quote, got caught. While receiving praise from supporters, President Trump has come under fire from Democrats who charge that he's bringing the United States to the brink of an illegal war with Iran with no congressional approval. General Soleimani is the leader of the foreign wing of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. He has been described as the second most powerful person in Iran after the supreme leader. The Iranians have promised to retaliate. Franco Ordonez, NPR News, Washington. Iraq's prime minister is condemning the assassination of Iran's general, along with Iraqi militia commander Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, uh, in that strike. NPR's Lema Alarian has more. The U.S. airstrikes on Baghdad International Airport is an act of aggression and breach of Iraqi sovereignty, the Iraqi prime minister Adil Abdel Mahdi said. He warned that the strike will lead to war in Iraq, the region, and the world. Abdel Mahdi said the two military leaders were huge symbols of the victory against ISIS. The Iraqi leader invited parliament to convene an extraordinary session, calling on them to take legislative actions that would safeguard Iraq's dignity, security, and sovereignty. Meanwhile, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad has urged its citizens to depart Iraq immediately. Lamal Aryan, NPR News, Beirut. U.S. officials say they're also concerned that Iran might retaliate for the killing of Qasem Soleimani with a, uh, with a cyber attack against U.S. infrastructure. NPR's Pam Fessler has more. Christopher Krebs, head of the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity Agency, tweeted this morning that it was time for U.S. businesses and government agencies to brush up on Iranian cyber tactics and pay special attention to potential threats against systems that control manufacturing, oil refineries, and other critical infrastructure. That's NPR's Pam Fessler. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden says President Trump has tossed a stick of dynamite into a tinderbox with the killing of Iran's top general. The former vice president joins other Democratic nominees in criticizing that strike this morning. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is calling the attack dangerous, while Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren says it was reckless. The price of global oil has surged this morning following the drone attack in Iraq. In early trading, the international benchmark for crude oil is up by almost 4%. On Wall Street, traders are also responding with sell-offs. At last check, the Dow was down 245 points, the Nasdaq down 65 points. This is NPR. Good morning from the WGBH Radio Newsroom in Boston. I'm Henry Santoro. Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, is speaking out against the U.S.-Iraq airstrike that killed an Iranian top military commander. Appearing on WGBH's Morning Edition this morning, Bennett called President Trump's decision targeting the head of Iran's elite military force reckless, saying it could escalate the conflict. But I think this was a terribly reckless and provocative act. It's the latest in a long string of non-strategic choices that Donald Trump has made in the Middle East that has weakened our position in the Middle East, that has strengthened Iran's position in the Middle East. Bennett says he's eager to learn the legal justification for the airstrike by the Trump administration. Following the attack, Iran has vowed, uh, vowed harsh retaliation. 
Police say a woman from Somerset, Mass., who claims to be a psychic, stole more than $70,000 from a client by telling the woman her 10-year-old daughter was possessed by a demon and that she needed the money to get rid of it. Tracy Milanovich has been charged with obtaining property by trick, along with larceny and witness intimidation. Police started their investigation on the 37-year-old Milanovich when the alleged victim reported that she was tricked into handing over cash, towels, and bedding to the psychic so she could go to battle with that demon. Milanovich was arraigned this week and released on personal recognizance. In sports, the second-place Boston Celtics take on the Atlanta Hawks at the Garden tonight. Tip-off is at 7. Don't look for the Patriots on Sunday. They're the wild-card game against the Titans tomorrow night. Kickoff is at 8.15. 46 degrees in Boston right now. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Atlassian. Whether it's keeping thousands of people on the same page or managing projects from start to finish, Atlassian works to unleash the potential of all types of teams with collaboration software. More at Atlassian.com. I'm Henry Santoro. This is WGBH. Jim Browdy, I am Marjorie Egan. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 WGBH. It's Friday. We are broadcasting live as we do every Friday from the WGBH studio at the Boston Public Library. You know, Jim. Hi, Marjorie. And you still dance to the, uh, to the theme music. We even I love it. haven't even introduced the <laughs> oh, guy sorry. yet. Who is this guy? Sorry. You know, Marjorie, before we do introduce our guest, member, you know, I've been a big advocate for the four-day work week yes. for centuries. Right. What do you think of the two-day work week? That's oh, been working out pretty well, nice, does it not? Very nice. You can kind of <laughs> ease back into 2020. Okay. In any case, at the 2012 Democratic National Convention, this is how Governor Deval Patrick characterized the presidential race between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. This is the election of a lifetime because more than any one candidate or policy, what's at stake is the American dream. That dream, the ability to imagine a better way for ourselves and our families and then to reach for it. That dream is central to who we are and what we stand for as a nation. Whether that dream endures for another generation depends on you and me. But it also depends on who leads us. So who knew that six years on this race would feel like the election of a lifetime and quite possibly the election of Deval Patrick's lifetime now that he's uh, the one running for president. Governor Patrick, it is great to see you again. It's How are you? It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Well, g- Governor, let, let's start with the big breaking news of today. I want your reaction to mm-hmm. the assassination of this uh, uh, Iranian general, uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, drone strike near the airport. Um, yeah. What do you think? Wow. Pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary news. Pretty um, uh you know, it's hard to be be hard to be in any other place than to wish the worst for this character. Um, he was a dangerous and destabilizing force uh, in the region, presence in the region, and uh, I, for one, do not mourn his death. But, uh, or I should say, at the same time, um, the consequences, the what's next, is a bigger question even than usual because we are led today by a president who doesn't think very often, as far as I can tell, about what's next. So I have to believe, I want to believe, that there is intelligence information available uh, to the president, president, that there is uh, uh, consultation with our allies that uh, would be available uh, to the president, but I have very little confidence that he availed himself of that. And therefore, I think um, we all need uh, an explanation for his reasoning and some understanding of what uh, the administration believes are next steps so that we can prepare for this. So even if Governor Patrick, even if it turns out it was not the right choice, and as we learned, at least I learned in the last 24 hours, both uh, the second President Bush and President Obama apparently had a shot, and I don't mean that as a pun, at Soleimani and decided to pass it up because of the potential uh, repercussions. It's Friday morning, January 3rd, and it has happened. The President of the United States has ordered the hit. It was successful. What do you do uh, starting this morning if you're President of the United States now? Well, my point um, uh, remains that, uh, you know, you have a whole apparatus at your disposal, not just uh, the folks who who guide the drones and and pull the trigger on your order. You have uh, diplomatic uh, relationships and you have intelligence. You have to inform yourself. 
there are uh, I, somebody uh, made the point uh, on another show earlier today. I think that you know just because uh, Iran puts a banana banana peel in front of us doesn't mean we have to go step on it. So it is ha it has happened, and therefore, what are the consequences? Well, not knowing all of the uh, all of the uh, uh, intelligence at uh, the disposal of the president, I guess I'd have to say on uh, with uh, with imperfect uh, knowledge. Uh, we need to be paying attention to how we protect uh, our people and our interests in the region, uh, and how we uh, um, uh, how we uh, secure our allies. Most most importantly, uh, Israel, which is uh, you know very very close to where this happened. If you haven't been to the region, you don't quite appreciate just how close everything is, and uh, uh, and you know Iran could very easily conclude that the most profound response uh, to this. Uh, attack is to uh, is a direct attack attack on Israel, and that is pr profoundly concerning. One last thing on this from me: Do you have confidence, based on what you've read and learned the last three years and talked to colleagues, that this president does know what he's doing when it goes to foreign policy? We've read stories about how cabinet members have pulled documents off his desk in the hopes that he won't remember that he was about to sign it's something terrifying. that yeah. they, they thought was uh, was negative, had negative implications for the United States. Do you have confidence that he does know what he's doing on foreign policy? No, I don't. Um, you know, I do. Th I, I think that he, you know, the evidence of how he's lived his life has been very impulsive, um, very situational, um, uh, and uh, and not a you know kind of measured, thoughtful um, uh, choices that he is, uh, has he's that he's made, and many of them have uh, gone sideways. Now, that's one thing for somebody who is fooling around with his personal fortune. Um, it's a, uh, and I'm not saying it's okay in that context, but uh, but uh, given the responsibility the president has uh, for so many of us, um, I would wish for uh, something better, and indeed I'm working for something better. We're talking with Governor Deval Patrick, who of course is running for president of the United States. You went, you've been in the campaign now for several weeks, so mm. uh, how's it going? It's been, it's been so exciting. You know, there's a, it's, I thought there was a path. Um, turns out there's a boulevard just wide open. Um, the, uh, you know, you read these polls if you believe them, and I think you guys know I'm skeptical of polls generally, but you read these polls, they leave out the fact that somewhere between 60 and 75 percent of the primary voters in the early states are undecided. So the up and down of the top four, so-called, uh, is talking about a very small sliver of the total uh, electorate, and about a third of those say they would change their minds. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I thought hard about this um, more than a year ago, and in fact, we made a decision um, to step in about a year ago, a little bit before Thanksgiving, and um, really we had a date uh, for launching and all that, and, uh, and then um, Diane was diagnosed with, uh, with uterine cancer. And that's the sort of thing that just, you know, brings your feet back to earth. Um, and uh, we paid attention to that and to her. I still think that was the right decision. Um, and had uh, you know made my piece to uh, con continue uh, uh, consulting with a half a dozen friends who are uh, in the field. Um, but as it's gone along, and I've watched how um, so many of my friends um, uh, have been kind of overtaken with the righteous anger that we all feel about where our politics is today, and it seems more and more like we are about to offer our democratic version of that, rather than uh, the work that we have to do to make change that lasts, which means you have to bring in people who may not agree with you. Keep the uh, goals ambitious, but bring in others. And I think that's how we got as much done as we did here in, uh, in Massachusetts in, my, uh, in our terms in, in office, and frankly, how I've uh, been able to solve problems in the private sector as well. But how do you, commu how do you communicate that kind of thing with short m money, uh, a short period of time, Iowa votes, I think it's 30 days, maybe it's 31, I'm not sure. Eight days later, New Hampshire votes, it's your neighboring state. I assume you feel you have to do relatively well in New Hampshire, oh is yeah. that correct? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, and, and if you don't in well New we're Hampshire? We're, gonna, we're, we're working on uh, <laughs> accomplishing that. Okay, so uh, how, but do look, but how do you get that you, message? You, you show up, you show up, um, you know, we are, uh, we are respectful of the schedule, there's no doubt about that. Um, and as a practical matter, uh, though we have uh, staff in each of the early states, we are building fastest and deepest 
in New Hampshire and in, uh, uh, and in South Carolina um, because primaries are just different than caucuses. I don't know if you spent any time on the Iowa uh, caucus. No. It's just a, it's a, very, it's a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, scene. Um, and uh, I've spent some time out there and we'll be, we will be back uh, either next week or the week after. But spending most of my time in New Hampshire and, uh, and South Carolina because primaries are different. And the expectation uh, is that you spend time with people, which I actually like to do. Uh, and we'll be up on television in, uh, in those two states uh, as early as next week, uh, I think. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, I think it actually we've been very, very well received. It's, um, I've gotten a lot of encouragement. And um, I can tell you that in the first two hours, three hours of the website going live, we had thousands of volunteers sign up from every single one of the 50 states. I think there is um, more than enough uh, encouragement um, to continue to build, and we're building fast. So there's a lot of people in this field. I think at one point it was 18, 19 people we had. It's obviously pared down now. What is unique about Deval Patrick uh, that, that you can offer? That well, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of good people. You remember, I, I, I think I told you once that uh, I told um, then-President Obama that the two things I liked least about being a candidate were uh, uh, raising the money and the bragging. And he said, get over it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm yeah. getting over it. Yeah, um, bragging's important, I yeah. think. <laughs> but I mean, look, look um, the other candidates have uh, a lot of great ideas. We have results. Candidates are talking about expanding uh, health care to everybody. That is what we should be talking about. 99% of the residents in Massachusetts have health insurance uh, uh, today. Hardly anybody's talking about uh, cost containment. We've been, uh, uh, we started on that, uh, on that path because it was a gap in the, uh, in the bill that Governor Romney uh, signed. And I think just, uh, just last year or the last year reported, health care costs rose in Massachusetts half the rate of the national you're not uh, a national Medicare, rate. You're not a Medicare for all guy. I'm not. Um, you know, I think that the, the public option is the right way to go. It's be fine with me if that public option is Medicare. Um, but I think there's a lot to like about having the competitive tension between private insurance and Medicare, where in the one case, in the case of private insurance, they're going to have to think about how to create a product to, to uh, compete for all those folks who will move to that no-cost or low-cost public option, and that's good in terms of the pressure on system costs. And Medicare, um, frankly, needs to up its game, too. If you are eligible for Medicare and you can, most people will buy a private supplemental uh, policy on top, right, because Medicare doesn't go far enough. So having that, uh, uh, that reason to innovate, that tension to innovate in, uh, in a public option, if that's Medicare or something else, I think it's also a good idea. You know, you just mentioned uh, your, one of your predecessors, Governor Romney. Are you disappointed by his silence through this whole impeachment Ukraine scenario? You know, more, more, than, that, more than that, Jim, I've been disappointed by the National Republican Party. You know, th this, is a, this is a moment when uh, we, have, we have such an Im incredible need for leadership. Um, and uh, frankly, candidate Trump, candidate Trump was right when he said that establishment politics wasn't working well enough for most people. It's the same uh, message that, uh, that Senator Sanders was talking about in 2016. It's the same message that Barack Obama was talking about a decade and a half before, and it is still true. Uh, I used to say uh, campaigning here that um, a lot about Beacon Hill felt like it was about Beacon Hill, just the, and the neighborhood around it. Uh, and if you were out in the Berkshires or central Massachusetts or up in Merrimack Valley or down the South Coast, or frankly, even in Roxbury, that people felt like their government was not about them. And I think that phenomenon is, uh, is national in, uh, in fact. So he got that point right. Uh, he got that, uh, that message about uh, draining the swamp. Uh, uh, I wouldn't have put it quite that way, but we do need um, fundamental reform in how um, we make our democracy actually democratic. Um, but he has paid attention to none of that uh, in office. And I'm not surprised by that. Um, I am surprised that there's been zero check on him uh, by, uh, by Republicans generally. Do you ever question his mental health when you see him on television? Y you know, it's not my place to do so. I, I, I'm, but I'm whose not place is it is I'm the problem? I'm not, I mean, I've read what professionals have written. Um, you know, it concerns me that he... He rambles, he's incoherent. It, it concerns me most of all that he lies with utter ease. Just this, and, and then when, when confronted 
um, with his uh, uh, with his with his lie, he just doubles down. So um, to keep looking the other way from that sort of thing um, by uh, by national Republicans, and I say that as a Democrat who doesn't think you have to hate Republicans to be a good Democrat. Um, I think that kind of behavior, that sort of false choice, is a big part of our uh, uh, political um, uh, troubles right now. Well, to, to bring back to uh, the concern about the president's um, state of mind is one of the things I think is very scary to people right now, the, the, because of this Iranian situation, right. the, the lying, you don't know, should you believe what he says? So, I mean, supposedly there was an imminent attack uh, ready to happen. What was that imminent attack? And we could, I, I think a lot of people are worried about our being in a war. Well, that's a, that's a very, um, I understand that, um, that worry, let me put it that way. And um, as, I, as I said at the, op uh, at the outset, it is, um, it is concerning that um, we may we, we, we may not have thought about the consequences of this action because we have a leader who tends not to think about the con consequences of his actions. If we had a different leader who uh, had built trust over time, had demonstrated that he or she was uh, uh, had taken account of our uh, uh, of the available intelligence, had consulted with our allies, had thought about, you know, what's the next step or two or three. Um, I think we'd have a different feeling right now. To your point about feeling afraid that we may uh, we may go into war, and uh, and I don't think people are ready um, for uh, for more war. So, Governor Pat, we're talking to Deval Patrick, uh, former governor of Massachusetts, obviously a candidate for the Democratic nomination for president. Did you read Eugene Robinson's piece in the Washington Post in the last 24 hours? No. Headline is, uh, Democrats start to look like a whites-only party. <laughs> and one of his first lines is something like, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't find it at the moment, so let me see if I got this right. Castro, who he refers to as the highest-ranking Latino elected oh, politician in America, and Harris are out of the race. And Tom Steyer and Buttigieg, who is the mayor of the fourth largest city in Indiana, are in the race. And then he makes the case that's pretty obvious from the headline. As of the moment, the five candidates who have qualified for the January 14th debate, the only debate before Iowa caucuses, are all white. What's your reaction to the state of the party that claims to be the party of diversity and, well, and in a place like South Carolina, 60% of the primary voters, as you know far better than I, or African Americans. What's your reaction? Well, I think we got to make. Uh, I, he's got a lot of great points, uh, or at least the ones you read are great points. You often give me things like that out of context, but. Uh, <laughs> Deval <laughs> Patrick <laughs> once said to me on a radio show oh, we did a monthly. Yes, he a says, line. "Jim Browdy, sometimes wrong, <laughs> never in doubt." Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Boy, Governor. I have I gotten Take a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> Go ahead, Governor. Uh, but no, I, I think um, I want to make a distinction, Jim, on a really serious point between. Um, who shows up on the debate stage and who's a candidate? And we've made a real, um, we've, we've made a lot more of the debate stage than uh, is warranted, particularly given, the <laughs> you know, how it serves or doesn't as a forum for communicating uh, ideas. Um, it is troubling to me that, um, you know, you ha you come in with a lot of money or, uh, or you raise a lot of money, and suddenly that makes you um, makes you so-called viable. I mean, it's fascinating. You know, and there were two candidates who had not announced in Michigan um, at the point when uh, the Michigan, the head of the party, submitted a list to the Secretary of State of who should be on the ballot. Um, one was me, and one was uh, Michael Bloomberg. But she put Bloomberg's name on that uh, on the list, and not mine. What's the matter with that? But she says you screwed up. She says your campaign never reached out to request being on the ballot. Neither did his. Um, but uh, the newspapers were reporting um, that both of us were imminently uh, going to uh, uh, going to step out. Um, what's that tell you? What does all of this tell you about uh, about uh, who gets to compete? Now what I does can't it be. What does it tell you? Well, it tells me that um, uh, this is another example of ways in which we make it harder than it ought to be to have a vibrant participatory democracy. And um, you know the 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 the. The standards for making the um, uh, the debate are one thing, and I think they will change again before New Hampshire, or so we have been uh, so we've been told. Probably based on who's still in or or out after Iowa. I don't know that, but I suspect. Um, but the question, you know, it's it has been 
hard for many candidates not just me to get on ballots in different states those rules are different in every in every state the way we communicate with with voters and i recognize it's a big it's a big country but this whole idea that it's about as much money as possible so that you can form your relationships with voters through thirty second ads in the last few weeks of the campaign come on that's it's it's not it's it's not conducive i think not just to uh, a, uh, a competitive process, but also to good policy making once, uh, once uh, we're elected. We're talking to former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, who's running for Democratic nomination for president. You know, you, we, Jim mentioned the Eugene Robinson column. Uh, you, uh, you ran the Civil Rights Division for a long time, right? Was for, uh, Justice uh, Department. Uh, yeah, the, for the uh, Department of Justice. I wonder what your perspective is on, uh, you know, Obama being the first black president. I think most people would say there's been a big backlash uh, and that, that there seems to be more unrest and, ra and overt racism now than, than, uh, than I recall, but maybe I'm out of it. I mean, what do you, th the atmosphere well, now in the Trump era? It's, I guess I'd say this, um, and I'm, I'm quoting uh, uh, John Walsh, whom you know, um, was my uh, campaign manager yeah. and, and uh, in our first campaign and a, and a great friend. And I think he was right when he said that it's probably true that all the racists voted for Trump, but not all the people who voted for Trump are racist. And I think that's important to digest. Um, there are, you know, people have lots of reasons for voting uh, for their uh, chosen candidate or not voting at all. And, um, uh, and so I think the outcome of 2016 was, uh, was a result of all of that um, uh, soup. The problem is that this president has um, given permission, I think, um, to, has normalized uh, a lot of deeply divisive behavior. In fact, it seems to me he wakes up every day thinking of ways to divide us. Um, and, uh, and the constant flow of uh, hateful tweets, the, 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 uh, the way he exemplifies uh, a lack of um, empathy and understanding in his behavior toward people, frankly, the way he seems to be interested in, in governing, or at a, uh, uh, maybe it's more accurate to say responding to only the people who voted for him, yeah. when the job is that, you know, once you win, you're responsible for everybody. So, but it isn't, uh, you know, never blame any of this on our leader alone. Um, we don't know each other in this country. Uh, we, um, we, we are, um, you know, when I think about the, f the ways in which, and I have had the security briefing, the ways in which Russia interfered with our 2016 uh, election, let alone what's going on now, um, the fact that they did is concerning. The fact that it was so easy to do is doubly concerning that it, we we accept this one-dimensional cartoonish um, impression of each other, and so all you have to do is kind of say the magic words, and then you fill in all the yeah. all the blanks. Which is one of the reasons why, in our democracy agenda, uh, we will propose universal national service um, because we need mandatory. To I wish, um, but the nation's not ready for this. It's really uh, General McChrystal's yeah. um, uh, program he's been working on for some while. And General making Powell or McChrystal? McChrystal. McChrystal? General, General Powell's been okay. uh, involved as well, but Stan's been leading oh, it. And uh, the idea is to expand um, uh, the opportunity, um, both on the military and civilian side, by, make, by paying people. So it's not just my kids who can do it, but, uh, but anybody. We need ways for Americans to serve alongside each other, um, uh, and I believe in the national interest, but have an opportunity to, to know each other from different parts of the country. We know you only have a couple minutes left. Can I get just uh, three quick things? You mentioned President Obama. Have you spoke to him, uh, spoken to him recently? I haven't spoken to him since November sometime. Since you declared. I think that's right. Since yeah. you quit. Yeah. Uh, number uh, two. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I know you hate, I know. <laughs> I, you uh, you, you know I wasn't going to tell you yeah. what he said uh, if I had I know, but so I don't have to ask that question. <laughs> so is, I know you hate labels. We've known you for a long time, but I'm going to try it anyway. I, you mentioned you're not for Medicare for all, you're for uh, the public option. I read somewhere you're not for the wealth tax. Is it fair to characterize you, for those who don't know you well yet, you hope they do, as a moderate to liberal-leaning 
candidate in this field? Is that how you describe it yourself? It doesn't really matter what I say because I'm going to be called all kinds well of things. Well, what would anyway. you call yourself if Look, I ask I, you? I am a, I'm a problem solver. You know, I, I think I love the fact that, uh, that the party uh, uh, seems ready, and frankly, I think the American people seem ready for big solutions to big, uh, to big challenges. I love that. Uh, my experience has been that delivering those big solutions requires that you bring people in. So um, I'd say my, my, uh, my objectives are very ambitious. My means of getting to those objections are probably more, uh, more moderate, and frankly, they are the kinds of uh, means that get changed that lasts. But you know, the reason I'm smiling is because uh, Marjorie quoted uh, your buddy uh, Barack Obama at a White House Correspondents' Dinner a couple of days ago, <laughs> relevant to this, when he said, people tell me, have a drink with Mitch McConnell. And Obama <laughs> said, why don't you have a drink with Mitch McConnell? <laughs> Last thing on my list of three, Governor. The reason I'm staring at you He likes bourbon. Uh, he does? <laughs> yeah. Well, you would know, I guess, from that relationship. But, but uh, I mean I'm Mitch McConnell. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, like I'm Kentucky, after all, right? <laughs> right. I'm staring at you, not just because you're our guest. As Marjorie said, when you, say, you look like you have 0% body does. fat. Oh, man. No, I'm he serious. Does. What is up with you? My, my, my staff won't feed me. No, I'm I, in all seriousness. May I send out a a a uh, uh, a, a, a humanitarian <laughs> message <laughs> on the air? They will not feed me. No, are you I'm serious about this because I've had a weight He's thing my whole life. And I know you were, had some weight things when you were a little boy. We've talked about it. What are you doing? You had to bring that up. I, no, I'm serious. What are <laughs> you? Totally not necessary. What are you doing? I'm serious. You look like a rock. <laughs> Thank you. Thank what you. Answer I'm wearing the question. Loose, I'm Come wearing on. loose fitting clothing. No, you're not. What are you doing? No, I've i you know I've been trying to be more. Uh, um, mindful about what I eat, Jesus. and uh, I'd, I'd like to exercise. I'd, I was exercising actually pretty regularly until I stepped out, and then uh, it's been harder to do. You know, I should say, when the governor sat down, he asked if we were taking calls, and uh, actually we hadn't thought about it. What we'd love to do is have you back before New Hampshire and take calls. So if your That'd schedule permits, we'll be in New Hampshire, too. We hope you'll join will us. Will you be there? Yeah, we will. Okay, yes, great. we're very great. excited. We'll the Radisson Hotel. We will. Governor, great. where all the action takes place. It's great <laughs> to see you. Happy New Year and yeah. good luck. Yeah, see you both. Governor Thanks Patrick, so great to see you. Thank you very much Be and well. good luck. Be well. Governor Deval Deval Patrick, Patrick 2020.com. Check Deval us out. Patrick 2020.com. Uh, Governor Deval Patrick is running for president. And again, to learn more about the campaign, go to Deval Patrick 2020.com. Thank you very much for taking the time, Governor. We appreciate it. Coming up, now for a total change of pace from the serious to the, well, maybe it is serious. But if you hit the snooze button, do you lose? We're asking you on 89.7 WGBH, Boston Public Radio, because I just didn't hit the snooze button and I got in big trouble. We are live from our WGBH studio at the Boston Public Library. Next time on The World, fighting climate change in the courts. The idea is to hold someone accountable